Okay, so uh, I think we have uh, enough people now, so I think we'll get started. Um, so uh, thanks for coming back. This is our second to last class. Our, our next last class is uh, going to be next week during reading week because everyone agreed um, that we would go with the last um, class during reading week. So uh, I appreciate that. Okay, um, I want to highlight a couple of things to you. Okay, um, first and foremost is the fact that we have our um, steps coming up next week. So that means everyone in the course, including those from the first half of class need to be there. Okay, so um, uh, unfortunately because during steps, I actually have to grade another class. I have to grade the CS3244 class. So I'll be pretty busy taking care of that. So you guys are uh, presenting, uh, just be good ambassadors for NUS, for all the guests that are coming. Um, and you're all already registered for the steps presentation. So you don't need to worry about registration for that. Okay, uh, so I'll put up your posters, present, talk with other people. And if you want to come around and look at the CS3244 presentations, that would be quite welcome, okay? So um, I hope you have populated your the information on the STEPS system. So I think uh, we have a, quite a number of, uh, you have already put up your, your modules already. So um, we have a couple of them. So those of you who haven't put in your, your information, please put them there. Okay, so we only have um, a, a couple of them here. Okay, so can you please put your information in soon? Okay, you put in already, okay, good. All right, so then um, the rest of you, if you haven't put them in, uh, please, please do so, okay, because um, it's obviously better if there's uh, people there uh, and the, the site is uh, a little bit more populated with information. Okay, um, so during steps itself, um, obviously you don't have to be there for the whole thing, although there is a prize ceremony at the end. So, um, you know, I'll try to ask uh, the organizers, since we have a small class, to just give one prize for a top project. So if you want to get the top project prize, it just means you have to get, uh, you know, talk about your things to people, um, discuss uh, and try to get them to vote for your project. It's not hard to do that. Um, and it's not bad, it gives you a little bit of money and, and maybe a little bit of recognition. Um, okay, so um, after steps, we have our final uh, class that will be the following week because um, that week, as I said last week, uh, week 13, I'm actually not going to be available because I got co-opted into some university functions and I won't be able to teach class as normal or I should say facilitate class. So that means that uh, we won't have class next week, we'll just have steps. And then the final class, which will go over, um, I think, um, as we discussed here, uh, it will be uh, probably the reinforcement uh, learning lecture, right, representation learning. Um, those of you in week 13 are responsible for that. So we already have cut off the week 13, that means the people who were originally allocated for week 12 as scribes as well as presenters are going to be presenting this lecture uh, on week for, uh, in, during reading week. Okay, so um, can I check who is going first for this round of presentation? Okay, Shochi. Okay, great. So um, let's go to your presentation. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah, I think you know how to work it because you've already used the, the iPad for a couple of times. Okay, yeah, thank you. Hi. <laughs> so today we are going to uh, introduce language model and the users. Uh, it's quite interesting. And yeah, <laughs> to start with, we show some samples uh, like, uh, the interesting one is the uh is the first the second one the meaning of life, uh yeah. 
it, it just some uh, paper on the on the past past work that have been done. <laughs> and yeah, like uh, so, <laughs> I'm going to introduce statistical language modeling, and like so, uh, by this this is like by uh predicting the the probability of how uh probable the this sentence is going is can be correct. So uh, but. It may sound weird, like uh, what's it, what? How what does it mean to compute the probability of a string, like the probability of the cat set on the mat? If we say the cat sets on the mat, should we give the probability to zero? Maybe not, because even uh, us humans, we also make uh grammar grammatical errors. So probably should, will be should be lower than the uh the one but shouldn't be zero, and then uh also like the a good language model should uh be able to to incorporate more knowledge just like the it's much less likely for Hina to sit on to sit on the mat than a cat because a Hina is not a house any not a house anymore so it's uh the probability of it sitting on the mat should be lo much lower and the also like for the two plus two equal to is it equal to four but human like to joke about uh joke around and say it's equal to five so yeah so uh there are different things to consider into in building a language model and yeah so how can you use the probability of a string? Uh, speech recognition and machine learning, machine translation are supervised tasks. Yeah, it's uh, quite self-explanatory. <laughs> and yeah, so there's a whole lot of internet out there, and. Uh, a perfect language model needs to fit the internet into these parameters because there are so many words and there are so many information and so many, so much things to consider, like all the world knowledge and the, and uh, like grammatical errors. So yeah, it, it sounds we need to use a lot of parameters. Uh, this also uh, we need to scale. Uh, this thing is not really important, but we need to keep this at, on back of my, our mind for this class. Uh, yeah, because the best architecture, the like every all the classic resources, like one that are like are much larger are larger than M, like many models trained today. Then it's it may be quite useless and because it's inefficient, so we need to scale. And yeah, these three papers basically talk about uh, scaling uh, can be quite helpful. Like the first, the first, first graph is the first paper talk about the uh, the x axis is the training data set size. Uh, then the y axis is the validation loss. And we can see that it's pretty cons it's pretty stable as you increase the layers and yeah yeah you can see the order of the of order of magnitude on the x axis is two to the power of twenty to two to the power of twenty eight, and then the second one is uh is a classic image classification. Yeah, so how can we compute the probability of a string? So we, uh, we often uh, use tokenizer to, to, to ease the process, and this, uh, these are different ways to dice a string. Uh, hexa level, byte level, Unicode symbols, tokenized word level, and byte pair encoding. Uh, so how to compute the probability of a string? The most simplistic model is 
uh, we assume a uniform prior over tokens and assume all tokens are in, all independent. This is uh, just really simplistic and uh, we can do better than that. So we assume we don't assume a prior, uniform prior over tokens and this is unigram language model which is to estimate the probability of a model by counting the occurrences and normalize this count by the to total number of tokens seen. And then uh, to do even better than this, we don't assume all tokens are independent, so we use conditional probability. So like for example, the cat set on the mat, we uh, maybe the, we start with the, with the then the P, uh, this PT1 given T0, then we, PT1 given T0, then is uh, probability of cat given the so on and so forth. So you take into account the relationship of the of the what of the what with the or the token with the previous token. But we have a problem here. Uh, we may it, it may be hard to generalize like self attention. This kind of word maybe you may never see before. So you probably you make a zero probability of zero. Then it will which means infinite loss, but uh, which will result in, in extremely inaccurate model. So to solve this, we apply smoothing. Uh, with, to smooth things out, we use a mixture model. Yeah. And uh, how, so how can we evaluate uh, different language models? Language models are often within rounding error of zero. So uh, character level use base two and report each per character. And often they they can only improve by a bit of like 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 is quite frustrating. And uh, so the prof in the lecture couldn't, ima <laughs> couldn't imagine him uh, do to do this a few years ago because one and a half years ago, because uh, it's just simply, simply like it's, you don't feel the sense of achievement because it's you're just improving uh, zero point zero something. Yeah. Uh, then another evaluation is uh, evaluation type two. Yeah, that's, that's my part. Uh, okay, let's continue lecture. Uh, so the, an, another type of evaluation the language model is depend on your task. For example, if you are doing the speech recognition, then the word error rate maybe is your metric. And for example, another like uh, document classification, then you may use accuracy to check your language model. And uh, so if we want to use a language model, what information do we need? The first one may be the point-wise neutral information, PMI. So this one is, is a metric to calcul uh, calculate the association between two words. Uh, we can see the formula here. Okay, yeah, so uh, it's do, do a log calculation to calculate the association between X and Y. Uh, and another way to, uh, to get information of the words is like uh, using embedding. <laughs> so there's embedding called glove. Uh, it's, it's calculated in this way. First, we, 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 we uh, get a matrix, which is the co occurrence between two words. And so it's a big matrix. And given this matrix, we uh, minimize the cost, which the formula is like this. So how do we minimize this? Uh, what, uh, um, this part is our, uh, this part is our co-occurrence co matrix. And this part is our embedding. So we want our embedding to as close as uh, to as to our uh, co-occurrence matrix. So we want to minimize this, and we do this by the uh, SGD. 
and then after this, we can get our embedding to using our language models. And uh, uh, so we can see that uh, using the uh, using our embedding solely, uh, we can get some uh, decent results. And there is another way to improve our method further. So after we get embedding, we input our embedding into some layers uh, called uh, contextualization, and then we can get a better result. So how does it done? We can see in the uh, <laughs> yeah this part. So so this is our embedding like our globe, and then we pass it through some layers, some RSTM layers, and to further capture the meaning of our embedding. And so this this is a process called contextualization. And it is proved that this kind of ways can uh, improve our results. We can see from the figure just now. Yeah. So this is how we capture information from words. And then uh, how do we build a language model? So there is a very uh, important model in the history that is present is proposed in 2003, which is the first model used to use a neural net. So we can see that there are two layers. One uh, is activation layer, and the other is a softmax layer, layer. So our input is just our uh, context, like our previous words. And then our output is given the context, what's the probability of our next word. This is the first model to use neural net. And uh, it learns the distribution probability of our word. And later, the, as our model gets improved, RN is pro. Uh, we uh, some 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 researchers use RN to to uh, improve our language model. We can see that the RN is here is used. So previously just a simple neural net, and then RN is involved to get a better model. And then uh, uh, also uh, there there are some very complicated models like uh, this one proposed in 2011, which is just. It's also RN, but it's a character level. So it's like uh, given a character and then predict the next character. And uh, it's very complicated. We can see from the paragraph here. So also there are the contest word, contest character. And the, we can see that there are a lot of errors and it's very complicated. And so it's very complicated to uh, do the optimization. And uh, so besides RN, we all know that there's a model called RSTM. So there are later models to using RSTM to improve model. And we can see that this paper proposed in 2013 is using, uh, not strictly the LSTM, it's a variant. We can see that there are some gates like the input gate, bug gate, and the cell gate. Uh, this one is, is different from the traditional LSTM because it's also used the cell gate inside their input gate and bug gate. Uh, but it's quite similar to LSTM. So to improve our language model, to capture information between the words. And, yeah. and then, uh, we, we all, the previous model we see before all the uh, supervised models. And there is a model, which is a semi-supervised, which first use uh, the pre-training to get the parameters. So it's like uh, using the per, uh, solely using the input to get to initialize parameters. And this is the unsupervised learning and to get the parameters and then use the, init, the parameter to initialize the uh, subsequent supervised learning, like the LSTM to train our model. Okay, and then uh, there is a paper proposed in uh, 2016, which proposed by Google, which is uh, try to uh, explore the limit of the language model. Like, see if we have a lot of words, like like uh, one billion words. Uh, what if we have a very complicated LSTM layer, and uh, what is the best result we can achieve? So it's it's run it's trained for one week, and uh, over three weeks. And uh, it seems to reduce the uh, uh, perplexity uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, it was the first model, uh, like say by the uh, prof, like it's to have a coherent sentence. So it's like the, the sentence generated by this model is uh, more, uh, more human sense. And then from this, from this paper and some uh, new papers are going to try to see whether there are some improvements we can get. So one way is to uh, 
continue using very large data. Like this one, this paper is using uh, 80 million reviews and to generate, to uh, get a sentiment from the, uh, of the review. And it seems that it can learn the sentiment with very large data. And another way continue to plot the model is like improve the STM hidden state size, like with very, a lot of new needs and to try to uh, get a better results. And another, uh, like another way is like to improve the total parameter count and to keep continue improve the model. Like with a very complete model with uh, a lot of parameters and to see whether we can get a better result. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, actually, so this is part because the original lectures audio is missing. So uh, I, I couldn't uh, uh, learn from the lecture. So I just uh, can give us, uh, give you a general explanation. Yeah, so yeah, that's all for this part. So I'll be talking about uh, GPT-1. So GPT-1 is uh, basically generative uh, pre-trained transformer. So what they want to show is that they want to show, uh, they want to combine generative pre-training of a language model and, uh, and also transformers. So it's similar to DIAL, but they replace the LSTM with uh, transformer language model. And the reason being so is because LSTM usually has, uh, they can only look back maybe 50 to 200 contexts in, uh, in the past history, so they cannot remember too much. So if you use a transformer, it's able to uh, access all the hidden uh, time steps in that sense. So GPT-1 has about 12 attention, self-attention blocks, so 12 uh, transformers stacked onto each other. Each attention block inside it will have uh, 12 attention heads. Then within, so uh, then the dimension state is 768. That means the uh, fully connected layer inside the transformer block has 700, uh, 768 uh, neurons. So in total, it has about 100 million parameters. And they train it on the book corpus. So it has about 7,000 books, uh, 5 gigabytes of text. So they, once they do the generic pre-training of the language model, they perform a fine-tuned training on supervised tasks like uh, sentiment analysis, uh, classification, so on and so forth. And this removes the need for uh, task-specific architecture. So they, have, they can have the same uh, language model and then apply like fully connected layers for us specific task. So they can do things like classification, uh, which is basically classify labels, um, entailment. So you see if the premise uh, uh, entails a hypothesis, true, uh, is it entailment, negation, or neutral. Uh, similarity, you can compare if two texts are similar. Uh, so what they do is that they fit in uh, text one and text two, and then they put it to a transformer, get the uh, output, and then reverse the inputs of the text with so text two, text one fit it to transform, get the outputs, and then send both outputs to a fully connected layer. And I think it's they do a prediction of zero or one. So one if they are both texts are similar, zero if they are not similar. And multiple choice is also, they can do multiple choice. So they fit in context, which is the question. And they fit in the, uh, the question and then the possible answer one, fit it to transform, get the output, repeat for answer two, answer three, and so on and so forth. And you can send it to the uh, fully connected layer. So if the answer is the correct answer to the context, the labels could be one. And then if the answer is not the uh, correct answer to the context, the label could be zero. And you can train the, uh, the, the model to perform this task. So on this graph right here, they show, um, they show how uh, when they transfer more layers from the uh, language models, the performance on downstream tasks improve. So you can see from two to 12, uh, there's a steady rise in the performance. And the graph on the uh, right, on the extreme right side shows uh, the performance of the model on uns after unsupervised training, so no fine-tuned training. And they showed that uh, the models can perform these tasks, uh, sentiment analysis and so on and so forth quite well with, uh, with just unsupervised training. Oh, the only downside was the question answering, which, they, which is the red line here, which couldn't get above 0 0.5, which is uh, random guessing. And you also compare it to LSTM. So LSTM would be a dotted line. 
for the LCM is uh, significantly worse than a transformer model for this purpose. And next, uh, I'll talk about a brief recap of uh, attention. So attention, you have three things, that uh, three matrices that you have to deal with. The query, key, and value matrix. So the query is basically uh, what you want to look for. Key is uh, what you can compare to. And um, value is the information you can retrieve. So basically, in this example they shown here, they are querying the word the. So they query, they query the word the. So when you query the word the, you have to do a computation against uh, every single other words. So uh, attention will be C K D equal to soft max Q K T So the okay, first step you get the uh, you calculate the three matrices for each word. The cat set on. And then you do a uh, dot product of the query with the value of other words. So you have, uh, for this case, you have Q, the, and then key of the, for example. Then you have uh, Q, the, K, cat. Uh, so this will be vectors, uh, set, and Q, the, K, um, ont. So all this uh, will be vectors. You get uh, these four numbers. So when you do the calculation, you'll get a, a number and for each uh, computation. So in this case, uh, the, so the dot product will sh uh, show how similar both words are. So in this case, they're showing that the and cat are very similar. So that's why they have a high uh, dot product. And then to get the uh, final, so what, after you compute the uh, attention, which will be, for example, let's say you have Q. Oh, uh, annotation is. Oh, okay. Wait, this one? Okay, thanks. So you have Q, the, for example, K. So for example, you get this, uh, numbers after computing and dot products, and what you do is you normalize it. So you do one over dk times one over, uh, so a square root of dk for every single one. And then perhaps then you pass through a softmax. And what you get is, for example, uh, I'll write it here. So you can possibly get uh, 0 0.2, sorry. Basically, you get 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Then you multiply by the value uh, vectors to get the find the appropriate weighting for the vectors. The vec so this will be the values, value of the, and uh, so on. This is a value of on. You get a weighted vectors, and then you sum them up. And this basically is this value vector right here. So this is a, this is a transformer for encoder and decoder model. So it's usually used for like sequence to sequence uh, tasks. So you have encoder taking the one sequence and then you map it to a, a sequence of another length. And if you're just doing language modeling, you only need uh, one part, which is usually the decoder. So it's, uh, you only need this part for the language model. So um, in a, basically in a transformer, you have the uh, attention block. And within attention block, you of course con uh, compute the uh, dot product between um, Q and K. And afterwards, uh, read the value. And then so then you will scale it. So divide by one over square root of DK. You mask it. So masking is usually carried out in the uh, decoder part. So you don't want the 
um, when you are querying a single word, you don't want it to look to words if they happen in the future. So you only want to compute the attention based on what happened in the past. So those, you only see this in the uh, decoder part. And apply softmax, and then yeah, so in the transformer, usually there's multiple heads, so you have uh, multiple attention heads. So you get attention matrix for each head, and what you do is just concat them, and you multiply by some uh, weight matrix before you send it to the uh, fully connected layer. So this is just a graph for showing how the attention is in a transformer. So I can see that, so basically this is from one attention head and this is from another attention head. And they sort of like focus on different tasks. So this one perhaps focus on the shorter range uh, context, uh, shorter range uh, attention context. So it, it doesn't look too far outside, whereas this one focuses on the longer range uh, attention. So perhaps this one is maybe from the lower layer, this one from the like, higher layers in the uh, transformer block. And so different attention heads learn different uh, attentions. Um, also another example they show is how uh, attention is very good at identifying which word to place attention to. So for example, in some uh, senses, it's very similar to the bottom one, except the final word is tired versus white. So because the final word is tired, the top one, it knows that eat is referring to animal. But then in the bottom sentence, because the final word is white, it knows that the animal usually not, is not white, but the street is white. So it places, when it queries the word eat, it places more attention on street. And that's different from the top one. So basically, by combining uh, generative pre-training of language model and uh, supervised fine tuning training, uh, GPT-1 was able to get uh, state-of-the-art scores for quite a lot of uh, data sets and tasks. So this is uh, sort of the, the scores that they achieved at the time. So black one means state of the art. Yeah. Yeah. Is it possible that all the heads are learning the same? Uh, the one uh, I, I'm not very sure, but I think it could possibly happen. But uh, I think it also depends on how you initialize it. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I think with the, maybe the same attention hits, the same attention hits within the same layer might possibly learn the same attention representation, but I think on different layers, then you might get different ones. I think something like, I read something like on the lower layers of transformers, usually the attention span will be shorter, whereas as you get higher levels, you'll get wider and wider, so it looks further back in history. So yeah, in the same layer, it could possibly be the same, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Yeah. Uh, regular, sort of like, from what I understand, uh, and I could be completely wrong, I, I, I invite you guys all to correct me. From what I understand, it's like having multiple filters um, in a scene, and you know, this each filter is going after a different um, attribute uh, or pattern in the data set. Um, you know, it could be going after an edge or a corner or a texture. And uh, the multi heads are doing the same thing, example, as trying to recover certain patterns, right? So it might be, you know, um, uh, resolution of uh, an opera, it might be gender or um, uh, uh, agreement between girls and females and things like that. So, exactly how many attention heads, I, I guess, really depends on what you want to put in other things. The set number that you mentioned is over 100 attention. Yeah, for example, uh -huh. yeah. So I guess if you had so many, yeah, it would be like some of them would have to collapse and then they, they would probably capture quite similar things, right? Or they'll start to overfit and find the data that you don't really want to describe the thing in general. So it's like CNN, so I can just put on more and more. Well, I think of the number of attention heads is similar to the number of filters, right? Because in, in a CNN uh, fire, by default, you only have one filter, right? With three by three or one by one filters, you just have one. And then you can multiply that out for how many features you want this to go for, right? So you can say, well, I want to set faces, uh, fires, uh, 
high level semantic features on, let's say, clock level five or something like that. You might have 100 different features and you have 100 different filters. Right? So I guess you could vary the amounts of contention at, at each layer. But I'm not sure that you know they're, they're specifically locally uh, confined. Because I think the whole point of self detection was to get rid of this problem where you're looking at um, uh, very narrow content. Right, which is what uh, both R and N and Pigment have to spell with. They're only local, localizing on, on a small patch of locations. Right, with self attention, you have this uh, evaluator buff, right, and it's going over the entire set. Yeah. So, this comes to another restriction is that, you know, NLP has been for a very long time, as long as I can remember, very restricted to sentential input. Sentential input meaning that everything that you feed in is about a sentence. You never think about a whole paragraph. The way we think about paragraphs right now in NFP is a sequence of sentences, right? But we never think about the whole paragraph as one thing. Even for uh, you know people doing question answer, like generated doing question answers, for the most part, we think of a, a paragraph as just a sequence of sentences, right? We never look at the whole paragraph as a whole block, right? Uh, even when a sentence is actually multiple sentences, so we have a lot of times that. You know, So, um, yeah, moving on. So after GPT-1, there was uh, <coughs> something called BERT, which you probably all of you heard of it. So BERT, uh, when Google introduced BERT, they realized that I think bi -direct, you need bi-directional um, information, uh, sorry, bi-directional information to help improve its transformers performance on downstream tasks like classification and so on and so forth. So GPT-2 was basically, sorry, GPT-1 was basically an auto-regressive model. So uh, it only looks back to the past tokens Whereas BERT, uh, they introduced bi-direction, so they randomly mask 15% uh, of the uh, words in a sentence and then try to have the model predict those missing words. So in the form, it's kind of like a encoder language model. I mean, auto-encoder language model. And then they found out that introducing bi-directionality uh, bi -directionality improved the uh, language model's performance on downstream tasks. So uh, BERT base, BERT large, uh, improved the performance from uh, open AI's GPT. So, um, so moving on, uh, there's this task called natural language inference. So basically, it's I think it's in entailment. So in natural language inference, you try to predict the logical relationship between uh, P and H. So P is a uh, premise, H is hypothesis. So for example, example of a contradiction uh, relation will be a man inspects a uniform and a man is sleeping. So because a man is inspecting a uniform, uh, he cannot be sleeping. So this is a contradiction. So neutral is a premise doesn't, you don't, you can't really tell if the premise entails the uh, hypothesis. So for example, an older and younger man is smiling, uh, smiling. two men are smiling at cats playing on the floor. So you cannot infer the, I mean, the, you can't infer the second sentence from the first one. And entail, example of entailment will be, for example, first sentence, a soccer game with multiple males playing. And the second sentence, some, main, some men are playing a sport. So because you know that multiple men are playing a soccer game, you can infer that they are playing a spot. So this will be an entailment. So according to uh, the SNLI dataset, which is a natural language inference dataset, humans, uh, sorry, model, supervised models can perform the same level as humans, about 88%. But they realized that this was uh, like, uh, there's just like quotations attached to it because uh, they realized the dataset is not perfect. So for example, uh, when creating the SNLI dataset, they paid uh, human tuckers to uh, create this dataset. So they often use tricks to make this data. For example, uh, examples with negation. So for example, uh, this contradiction. They often have the word not, never, and nothing in the sentence. And for entailment examples in the dataset, they often have words like person, animal, spot. And for neutral uh, examples, they often have words like tall, set, popular. So what they found is that the model can actually just pick up this word, uh, this words and know that it's a uh, entailment negation or neutral. So they to test it out, they test uh, they train a classifier on only the second part of the sentence, and they realize that these cla this classifier can get up to sixty seven percent accuracy, which is uh, more than double of thirty three percent, which I believe they say it's uh, a random guessing. So 
this shows that the uh, data set is not, uh, it's not really a good representation of uh, natural language inference. Um, so what they do is that they try to create a new, yeah, a new data set. So this time around, they give it harder examples. For example, a uh, contradiction example would be like, uh, the man is holding an object, so it could be like orange. Then the man is holding a problem in Apple, and this would be a contradiction. So the sentences look quite similar to each other. And for entailment sentences, uh, sentence, they could do something like, a little girl is very, uh, free of the adjective, probably like happy. And then a little girl is very maybe delighted, for example. And then this will be uh, entailment because uh, it's a synonym of uh, adjective. So they built a new test set of uh, 8,000 examples to show, uh, to show that the SNLI data set is uh, flawed. And then they, when they tested the ES, ESIM uh, supervised learning model, they realized that the accuracy dropped from 88% on the SNLI data set to only about 66% on this new data set. So it shows that uh, the ESM, uh, ESIM model is overfitting to the SNLI data set. So they also showed that um, a lot of uh, state-of-the-art models they cannot generalize. For example, BERT model to train on SQUAT, which is a question answering data set. So it's a state-of-the-art on SQUAT. It get 86.51 FI, uh, F1, sorry. Uh, but the moment you change it to other data sets, other Q&A data sets like Trivial Q&A, uh, QAC, which are also question answering data sets, they realize the performance dropped. So the models are not generalizing what they learned from uh, Squat to uh, Trivial Q&A and Q QAC. So uh, what might go wrong? So what might be going wrong? So basically, uh, standard training data sets might not encourage uh, generalization. So for example, SNLI. So models learn uh, spurious associations in a training set. Uh, models can often exploit distributional bias of, uh, of the creation uh, of the training set. And models can stop learning once they get to zero training error. And our current techniques are quite brittle. So you change some parameters, they might not learn. Uh, and also current techniques are closer to memorization than journalization. And to make uh, progress, we perhaps need uh, better models or architectures, or have introduced more data, or have uh, different paths, or approach a different approach it in a new way. And that's uh, my part of the uh, presentation and lecture. Yeah. This one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I will actually. Uh, this part is actually not from the original lecture, and I think I will just uh continue just now the discussion about uh, some problems with uh with NLA datasets, and actually this problem uh exists in other data sets and models as well. So, uh, okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, this slide and the next slide are taken from the presentation from Eric Willis at EMLP a few days ago. So, uh, the problems of uh, why uh, NLP models can fail when under adversarial attacks are twofold. One is uh, because the data set itself has some kind of problems. Like just now, uh, he talked about annotation uh, artifacts. So some words are actually uh, sending a very strong signal to the model that uh, once the model sees the word, it doesn't actually need to understand the meaning of it. It directly knows the answer of it. And other problems can be the model problems itself. So uh, we will see from a few examples. Yeah, uh, some motivation why we care about it. So we want to generate uh, strong adversaries and this can actually let us understand how models behave and some limitations of the data sets. So um, I think uh, this area can actually uh, be divided into three different directions. So adversarial attacks and partial data training and also uh, analyze models by downstream or probing tasks. So uh, this last part I, I will actually skip because uh, there are a lot of interesting papers and most most probing papers, I think, are actually like experiment repositories, kind of uh, 
easy to understand. So I just skip here. So first direction, uh, adversarial attacks. Um, this paper is like, I think it's one of the uh, first few papers that started this direction. So the task is uh, on Scott data set. Basically you are given a paragraph and then a question and you are, your model needs to predict the correct answer. So the correct answer is actually a span from the paragraph. And um, what they are trying to show is that uh, when they add a, a, a adversarial sentence at the end of the original paragraph, like the blue sentence here, then the uh, original prediction will actually change. And you can actually see uh, the adversarial sentence actually does not change the meaning of the original paragraph. So even if you add this adversarial sentence, the correct answer is still the original one, but the model doesn't know that. And it's just predict some other answers. Like in this case, it, it, the answer changed to gifting, which is wrong. So how they construct such uh, adversarial sentences? So they give two uh, different methods. First one is called add sent. So they first uh, modify the original question. Basically, they just replace the words with uh, synonyms. And then uh, they generate a fake answer with the same type of the original answer. So uh, just now, the original answer is uh, this John Orway, and then the fake answer is Jeff Lin. So it's a uh, same type, but uh, a different one. So it's like same part of speech, etc. And then uh, they combine the question and answer, then write it into a declarative form. And then uh, they hire some workers to fix the grammatical errors. And then they add this sentence at the end of the original paragraph. Another one is actually uh, simpler, which is called uh, add any. And so they first uh, randomly in in initialize this uh, destructive sentence. And then they search over a set of words. You find a sequence that um, reduces the uh, FN score of the model the most. And since they, they actually don't care about the, uh, so in AdSense, they actually hire Turkers to fix the grammatical errors so that the adversarial sentence is actually meaningful and grammatical correct. But this one, at any, they actually don't care about the uh, meaning of the sentence. So they just care about whether this sequence will decrease the performance. And most of the case, the destructive sentence is like uh, meaningless, just a gibberish sentence. And uh, another thing to take note of is um, this is actually a uh, like white box attack because white box attack because uh, it actually uh, like text used like in Edison they actually just use the heuristics to construct such examples so you, you don't need to actually run the model itself but in any any they actually search over uh, a set of words to find the sequence that reduce the performance of both they actually they need to fit this adversary into the model itself and see whether uh, the model will be like attack or not. Yeah, so this is uh, just an illustration to show the two methods. And the result is that uh, when you apply these attacks, uh, the model actually will be full. And from the table on the right, you can see that um, humans are actually able to answer these um, questions correctly, even if you add these other visuals, but uh, models cannot, and they will just be full. So this is actually uh, uh, showing the problem of the model itself. So uh, the model is not robust enough. And I personally, I feel that the, the problem is that uh, if you look at the, uh, the adversarial uh, sentences, the, most of them will contain keywords from the original question. So it's saying that the model, the model is re relying a lot on the keywords from the questions. So when you add the, these adversarial sentences, it actually um, distracts the model to look at the new uh, adversarial sentence and make wrong predictions. Yeah, so yeah, that's uh, the first work. And another one is called hot flip. So just now they are concatenating the destructive sentence at the end of the original paragraph. And in hot flip, they actually uh, do not add anything. They just uh, change the, some keywords from the original paragraphs or inputs. So you can see in this case, uh, uh, the, in the first example, the word mood is changed to move. So they just change a single character and then the prediction will change and the yeah, the performance also change a lot. And the second example is uh, they change the character P to B in opposition and the prediction will also change. And I think humans will be able to like still solve these cases trivially, but uh, models cannot. And in this case, they are actually using uh, character-based models. So by right, these models are like, supposed to learn meanings from the character level. And yeah, so they can still be full. 
So the procedure of uh, generating such a text, the, the first they flip single characters, like the examples just now, and they actually use a gradient to estimate the influence of a single change. So uh, they argue that uh, if the gradient is very large, it means that this particular keywords or character have a lot of influence on the model. So these are kind of the keywords and then they like do those changes. And they also extend this to word level. Yeah, and to generate semantic preserving constraint, uh, to uh, examples means that they don't want the original meaning of the paragraph change after you add these adversaries. So they add these uh, constraints, basically the same as uh, uh, just now add sent. Uh, so use a uh, constraint similarity of word embeddings and part of speech checking. So after you do the changes, the meaning of the original inputs are the same. So the, mod, uh, the labels are also the same. So by right, the models should give the same input, but uh, yeah, it cannot. Yeah, so these are examples of changing at word level. So like in the first example, they change the word intriguing to interesting. And the meaning does not really change, but uh, the model will just be full. Yeah, and you can see when you use Beam search to generate such, such examples, the success rate is uh, very high, it's uh, above 90%. Yeah, so uh, these two works are actually uh, before BERT and uh, those stuff came out. So they're using uh, the SOTA models at that time. And after BERT came out, uh, we will see whether BERT will be full. Uh, this is uh, actually a very recent work called Text Fuller. And this is kind of uh, similar to the first two works, except that they are using BERT. So, the, uh, the attack procedure is firstly rank the most influential keywords, like the like similar to hot flip using a gradient to do estimation. Oh no, they they do, did that and they so uh, did something new, which is uh they measure the prediction change before and after uh, like changing or deleting the word. But uh the purpose is the same. They want to find the most influential keywords. Then they just uh replace those influential keywords like with uh synonyms similar to adsense. Yeah and. Uh, yeah, they use those constraints like policy checking and stuff to make sure that they don't change the original semantic meanings. Yeah, and then they just change those keywords. So it's very similar to hot flip at word level. And you can see uh, the last few columns are using BERT and you can see even if you use BERT, uh, using such simple attacks, the performance will also drop by a lot. And um, the first table is on a uh, classification task, and the second table is on uh, natural language inference. Yeah, so the lesson is that uh, even BERT is very vulnerable to such uh, attacks. And then um, this work is, uh, is a very interesting paper from EMLP this year. So the idea is very different from previous papers because uh, they, attack, they, are, they want to do a targeted attack, means that they want to force the model to make such uh, predictions. For example, they want the model for, uh, to predict to kill American people on Scott data set. Then they basically are trying to find a attack sequence that can make the model do that. And they actually, um, they want to find such uh, adversarial triggers so that they add the triggers to the original inputs that the model will make um, the predictions that they want. For example, the original sentence is, the movie is amazing, and the correct label is positive. Then uh, they want the model to, to predict negative. So you search over an entire space and to find a trigger so that they, when they add a trigger to the input, the model will predict negative. So um, these are some examples. So we did this on classification, uh, uh, in this case, sentiment analysis, and uh, reading comprehension and basically the Scott data set and also on uh, language generation, which is using uh, GPT-2. So yeah, on text classification, basically they want the model to predict a certain uh, label. And on reading comprehension, they want the model to predict a specific uh, target span. So in this case, they choose a span to, uh, to kill American people. Um, I don't know why they choose this uh, target, but uh, anyway, when they add the trigger to the original input, the answer will always be to kill American people. And the last one is uh, language generation. So they want the model to output uh, racist languages. And yeah, and let's see how they do it. 
So this is the approach. So basically, um, the first initialize a trigger sequence. Uh, so for example, the initialize the sequence as the, 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 and then they concatenate this sequence with uh, the input. So for example, for sentiment analysis, it's just a sentence like, this is an amazing film. And then uh, they get the loss and then they search over the, all the tokens and then they find the tokens that actually give the best probability for negative prediction. So this, this, in this case, the examples are all positive sentences but they want the model to produce negative tokens, uh, negative labels. So they find those set of words that actually give the most probability for negative prediction. And then uh, they iterate this process for many times and then find the best set of triggers. And yeah, for example, the, the best set of triggers they find on sentiment analysis is um, zooming taping uh, frames. So they add this trigger to the model and then the accuracy will just change a lot. So in this case, uh, all the sentences are positive originally, but after they add these three like meaningless words to the original input, the label will just change from positive to negative. Like even if you, you use uh, better representations, like almost it's still uh, very effective. And then um, you now I, they just need to add a single word, a single trigger, and then the model will, the performance will decrease by a lot. Like in this case, it will decrease to like less than 1%. And then uh, there's this interesting part about transferability. So just now I said that they actually search over a space to find the most effective trigger sequence. And they are using a single model to do that. For example, they use um, this ESIM uh, models and then they feed this uh, candidate uh, trigger sequence to the model and see uh, like, um, what's a negative uh, predict prediction. And so this is uh, targeted on ESIM model. But then after they find the best sequence, they apply this sequence to some other unknown models, like in this case, uh, DA um, plus ALMO is still very effective. So yeah, it's very transferable. And yeah, in this case, on uh, um, question answering, so Scott data set is, you can find actually it's even more effective on those are uh, unknown models that the search process does not, does not really rely on. And actually, uh, the other is it's because um, when you search the sequence using the BIDEF model in this case, the, the sequence actually are kind of overfit. So when you transfer to unknown models, actually uh, the, attack, the attack is more effective. And then on um, language generation, basically it's like uh, training a new language model then uh, using a set of resist sentences. So it tries to find the triggers that when you add those triggers, then the model will output resist comments. Yeah, then so the trigger they find is like this, are the, the words in red are, are the triggers. And then when they concatenate this with the original user input, it will just output uh, resist stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's very effective. Yeah, so uh, these are some other interesting papers on uh, the virtual attacks in NLP. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the second part, uh, partial training. So the idea of uh, partial training is, yeah. Okay, yeah, so like for example, the, for the universal triggers work, basically they just add the trigger to the, uh, at the front of the original input. Like uh, originally your sentence is this movie is. Uh, ah, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, same trigger was for every single sentence. You mean why this happens? Yeah, yeah um, my personal intuition is that uh, this is more of a problem with the data sets because they are kind of uh, like, when a model sees this word, it knows that it leads to this particular prediction. Oh, it's also like a model gets trained, like you train to a model. Yeah. And after it gets trained, there's another training task. You just try to just randomly blah, 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 put all the individual words at the beginning of the sentence. Yeah, so for all the adversarial attacks, you train on the normal input, then you attack with some, uh, like new test set. 
In this case, a new test set is basically you add a trigger sentence. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess that's future work. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Next part is um, so this work is about partial training on machine reading comprehension, and there are uh, so for reading uh, reading comprehension tasks, there are usually three parts. The passage, the question, and the answer. And by right, the model should need to know all these three parts in order to make a prediction. So even for humans, that's the case. If you don't know the passage, how do you get the answer? Or if you don't know the question, you also cannot get the answer. And so uh, in this work, the authors are trying to figure out what if I just remove the question or the passage, can the model still make predictions? So um, ideally, the models should not uh, perform any better than random. And they are doing this on uh, span extraction data sets. So the way they remove passage is that, because uh, they cannot just really remove the passage. Otherwise, how do you select a span from the passage? So they actually just contact, uh, replace the original passage with some uh, random gibberish. And the way they remove question is basically they assign some random question. So it's essentially the same as the model do not know the passage or the answer. And then uh, they train the model with only partial information. And then uh, they find out that actually the model can still do very well in some cases. And actually you can see in some cases it's even the like um, passage only or question only cases is very close to the full setting or like, or even the same as the full setting. And then in this level, you can see that like in the CBT data set, actually on Q only models can actually perform uh, even better than the full models in some cases. Yeah, so and on the last table on the Scott, you can see actually uh, on Scott, the such partial training is not so successful. It means that on Scott, it's generally um, not possible to get the correct answer with only question or only passage. Yeah. So yeah, so the takeaway is that um, it's not uh, this work is not showing the problem of models, but rather the problem of these data sets because you want to the real purpose of machine reading comprehension is to test the uh, model's ability of um, language understanding. So it should uh, read the passage and the question and understand the stuff and then do some reasoning and then get the correct answer. But now you only fit the question or the passage to the model, then it can already get the correct answer. Then What's the whole point of getting all the, the full data set? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you mean why uh, they can still get very good performance? Okay, so um, my, okay, still my personal understanding, understanding is that um, there are some uh, data set artifacts, like there are some association between the passage and, and the answer itself. So the model actually learns this kind of association. So you actually, when there is no question given to the model, actually learns this kind of association, which is not language understanding, because you it's impossible to use language understanding to get the correct answer when you do not know the question itself. Yeah, so it's using this kind of uh, associations, which is a bad, which is shouldn't exist in these data sets. So for example, in some, some type of words in the passage, when you see this type of words, you right away know that uh, the answer will probably be like this. Or when you see this type of question, you right away know that the answer will probably be like this. So you don't even need the passage or the question. So that's the problem of these data sets. Spend. Uh, in this work, they are doing a uh, span extraction data set. Ex uh, later, well, I will introduce a work about multiple choice, but this one is span extraction means you 
the correct answer is a span of the original paragraph. Yeah, yeah, correct. correct. Yes, yes. Uh, any other question? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so in this case, without a question, it still points to the correct span. So that's a problem. That actually defeats the purpose of machine learning conversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's essentially saying uh, some spans in the passage just uh, look like the answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, later we'll see. Um, yeah. yeah, later we'll see work on other data sets. So, uh, any question on this work? Okay, then we will move to the next. Uh, this one is already uh, explained in the last part. Yeah, basically, yeah, you can get good performance with only like the hypothesis from NLI data sets. Yeah. So, I'll skip it. Then, this work is also um, pretty new. Basically, um, they are doing this um, argument reasoning comprehension task. So the task is you are given a reason and a warrant, then you get you decide whether a claim is correct or not. And then uh, they actually find that uh, by right, the model should uh, know all the three parts, the, re the reason, the claim, and the warrant, all three parts to get the correct prediction. But when they actually only fit part of, like only fit the warrant, or only warrant and reason, or only uh, warrant and claim, can still get uh, very close to the full setting performance. It's very similar to the partial training in machine reading conversion. And, but the interesting part is that the author actually find that in this case, there's a very, very uh, significant statistical cues, which is the word not. So it is saying that when you see the word not, and you just um, predict, like let's say you just predict this claim, like when you see um, the word not, you know that this claim will be correct, like 60% uh, of the time. So yeah, this is like, we, are, we mentioned that there are some statistical cues in machine reading computation engine data sets. So when you see this type of words, you know that the, they actually lead to certain prediction. And in this case, the, I'm tell, the order is telling us that in this data set, the queue is just, the most significant queue is not, the word not. So yeah. And then actually when they, when they remove the word not, you can see the bird performance drops to about 50%, which is actually uh, around random, because there are only two possible claims. So the random baseline is about 50%. So essentially it's saying that um, bird is actually not really understanding the language to do predictions, but rather using these statistical cues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Ya, ya. Ya, ya. Yeah, so that's a uh, problem with this data set. So actually uh, people are starting to use this to build better data sets. So when they are building data sets, they actually run like run a bird model at the back end. Then, then they check whether the model can already like get the predictions with like current current uh, input. Then they try to get um, harder data sets. Yeah. And yeah, I will, for proving task papers, I will just uh, skip that and you can check out the paper list for interesting stuff. And yeah, uh, in the last section, I, I will just uh, like introduce our own work about adversarial attacks and uh, model analysis on multiple choice uh, reading comprehension data sets. You can, you can uh, read the paper by the link. Yeah, and so we are proposing uh, very simple methods to attack uh, multiple choice reading comprehension. Basically, it's, uh, first part, uh, add send to passage shuffle means that uh, we concatenate the question. And uh, in, so in multiple choice questions, you have a correct answer and several destructors. So our attacking method, the first method is you concatenate the question and the destructor options, and then you shuffle them. So after shuffling, the whole sequence does not make any sense. And then you concatenate this meaningless sequence to the original passage. And this is kind of similar to the add any by um, Zhang Liang. So, but you know, in a different way of constructing destructing sentence. And the second method, add sentence to option, is basically we select a random sentence from the passage, and then we concatenate it with the original destructor, and then we shuffle it. Then use this as a new destructor. And the last method is add answer to option. So basically we uh, I concatenate the correct answer and this destructor and then we shuffle it, then use this as a new destructor. So the motivation of us doing this is that we kind of guess that um, one of the reasons why model will fail on those attacks is because that sees certain keywords from the question or the uh, correct answers. And then these keywords were just help the model make correct predictions, no matter whether the model understands the language or not. So we, we use such a test to see whether these attacks were really like, for the model. Yeah, so uh, we test these methods and several uh, variations on uh, some uh, multiple choice data sets. And you can see actually uh, it's quite effective. Like in most, yeah, in all cases, the performance will drop. And yeah, and all, in all these cases, actually, you do not change the original meaning of the passage, or, and then the correct answer also do not change. You're just, in, uh, you're just in, adding like a meaningless sentence or sequence to fool the model. So it kind of shows that the model is really affected by these um, random keywords. So in a way, it is like re relying too much on these keywords to make predictions rather than really understanding the passage and the stuff. Because it, if it is really understanding the passage, then it shouldn't be affected by this random sequence. Like for humans, you are just uh, ignore this random sequence. Yeah, but for models, because there are some keywords in this random sequence, so it will just be full. And then we also tried um, partial training and shuffle training. So in partial training, which is uh, P remove, Q remove, and P remove, basically it's the same as the uh, work by uh, the, the partial um, MRC work as I just talked about. And we can see or in most cases, the model can get pretty high performance on only partial input. So this is saying that even on multiple choice data sets, there are still like a lot of some um, like statistical cues the, or this kind of associations that the model is relying on. So there are some problems with all the data sets. And actually um, like uh, some of the data sets like RIS are actually um, like very long and supposedly very challenging for models, but they are still like this kind of artifacts. And then for partial training, we are basically uh, like, for example, for P shuffle, we shuffle the whole passage. So the whole passage is basically meaningless. 
and then we uh, train the model using this shuffled input. And then the model can still get very high performance. In some cases, it's like uh, very, very close to the original full setting performance. And you, if you compare uh, shuffle training and uh, partial training, uh, shuffle training can still get higher performance than uh, those partial training. Means that the model can actually learn something from those shuffled stuff. Yeah, so my, my personal guess is that uh, Bird is actually learning like a uh, back of what style uh, representations. So even if you shuffle, it still can get some of it. Yeah, so you can check out the paper for some other analysis. Yeah. So that's my part. Thanks. So thanks. Uh, in my part, I will talk about summer potential trends and the future development of learning models. Uh, this is a, oh, sorry. This is an outline of uh, my presentation. Firstly, I will summarize summer potential trends of the learning models, uh, also introduced in the original slides. And uh, I will use two um, popular and recent um, advanced models to, to summarize summer common characteristics of learning modeling. Uh, it's named uh, uh, JPT2 and uh, T5. Uh, especially T5 is a uh, novel and uh, uh, released uh, recently about uh, three, two or three weeks ago by Google, and uh, it's a bigger and uh, great training model. And uh, lastly, I will introduce some uh, conclusions. Okay, the, as we all know, uh, in AI algorithm, especially the deep learning uh, models, uh, we have three important uh, factors of, uh, have been introduced by many people. The first one is algorithm, and the second one is data, and the third one is compute power. You know, you must have a, a high compatible uh, algorithm to for, uh, do the feature learning. You uh, extract the uh, bad feature from the extensive data, and uh, thirdly, you must have uh, more compute power to train the model, especially some pre-training model from the extensive data. Uh, another potential trend is multitask learning. You know, uh, in uh, the beginning, anyone, uh, the researchers are doing some tasks separately. You are do, uh, some people are doing sentiment analysis and someone works on uh, task classification, task generation, or something other tasks. Uh, at every task, you are just improve the height of one peak from the left figure. You can see that you are putting the height of one peak at uh, uh, in a specific domain. And actually, recently, more and more people are doing some uh, multitask learning. You know, it's through their algorithm uh, effectiveness on multitask. For example, uh, QA, uh, reading comprehension, or something other tasks. So. Uh, the JB2, uh, JB2 is a famous, familiar uh, big pre-training model. Compared to JBT1, actually it's no bigger difference in model structure, uh, big, uh, no big difference in the model structure. It's also using the uh, basic structure of transformer. Uh, just then add more layers and uh, use more data to training the, uh, to do the pre-training. Uh, the one difference is that uh, in JPT uh, one, actually it has two stages. The first stage is pre-training. Use more data and uh, uh, more compute power to do the pre-training process. Then it fine tune the model into some downstream task. For example, uh, the machine translation or other tasks. Uh, in this, uh, in JPT two, actually they have no uh, no the fine tuning process. It's just uh, do the zero short task transfer. It means that it use more data to train the uh, to do the pre-training, and uh, it's just uh, leave it the pre-training model to do the uh, evaluation on other tasks. Uh, it's also a multi-task uh, uh, model, and it improve his performance on uh, multiple tasks and. Uh, the data used in the pre-training process it actually grew from the uh, web page. You know, it's a tool named uh, uh, Common Crawl. It, it's crawl extensive data, about 40 GB of text to do the pre-training process. And uh, uh, compared to JPT1, it's actually used a more, uh, a bigger, a bigger model. 
uh, is up to uh, 1.5 billion parameters. Actually, it's a uh, high, uh, it's bigger than most of the models existing uh, at that time. It improved uh, its performance on several tasks. Uh, the first one is uh, reading comprehension, and the second one is translation. Uh, you, you can, as you can see, actually it's doing uh, well compared to summer super, uh, supervised uh, methods and uh, improve its performance on the, uh, in the setting of zero shot. Another model I introduced here is P5. Actually, P5 is a, a new model. It's proposed about uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, and it's uh, actually in JPT2, it's still used the setting of JPT1. It's a, a single directional representation. It's, uh, it has been proposed, proposed that in birth, that but for proposed that actually uh, bi-directional representation is better than the a unidirectional representation. But uh, in JPT2, the authors also use the setting of JPT, JPT1. Uh, but in T5, uh, actually the authors from Google also using the setting of birth uh, as a bi-directional uh, represent, uh, representation. As we say, uh, no, it's birth. It's birth, uh, but it has more parameters and more layers. It's the full name of T5 is text to text transfer uh, transfer transformer. Why it's named text to text? It's actually formulas all the uh, several uh, several NLP tasks. For example, machine translation, question answering, and uh, uh, abstract summarization or text classification into a text-to-text -text, uh, formulation. As you can see in the left fig, uh, the first uh, sample is a machine, is the task of machine translation. Actually, its input is a, a sentence in English or in other language, and the output is a, a sentence in other language. And the second sample is a, a, an, a task of, from a, QA or some abstract summarization. The input and output also uh, text. Uh, the one difference is that when we do some task, some, uh, for example, the sentence pair, uh, the similarity or calculate the similarity between the sentence pairs. Actually, its input is a two sentence and output is a score. Uh, you mean, the, you know, it's the, the score of the similarity. So how to do this in the text-to-text -text formulation. Actually, it's the prioritize the values. It's divide the uh, values into different intervals. As, as you can, uh, know, if, if the score is between one and zero, it's divided into 20 intervals, and uh, the output is a score from the uh, one interval. Uh, for example, in the, third, uh, in the third sample, the input is this two sentence, and the output is a a score, uh, 3.8. So this is uh, uh, to formulate all the NLP tasks into a text-to-text -text, uh, structure. It will mention that the T5 didn't uh, incorporate many uh, ch 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 uh, ch change to the original BERT uh, uh, model. It's just the use of uh, uh, more data. It's crawled about uh, uh, 750 JB text from the uh, website web page is also uh, is same to the JPT2, and uh, it do a lot uh, pre, -proce uh, pre process of the data and the crawl the uh, data set named C4. Uh, this is a big data set, so it use a, a bigger model to train the um, to do the pre training. Uh, the Largest uh, model has about uh, uh, 11 billion parameters and uh, it, it divided its performance on four tasks, machine translation, question answering, and the obstructive uh, summarization and text classification. Actually, it's uh, tried many different model structures. In the left figure, you can see that it uh, has three uh, main structures. The first one is encoder to decoder, and the second one is library model, and uh, the third one is prefix library model. Uh, the first one is that uh, it's actually same to the bird. Uh, in the encoder, the, uh, it's used uh, uh, 
bi-directional learning and uh, uh, bi-directional representation. And uh, uh, when decoder, it can only look to the world before the predict world. So in language model, it's same to the decoder. And the uh, perfect language model means that it can, uh, in the first, uh, in the first several words, you can use the bi-directional representation. And uh, in, when do the prediction, you only looks into the world before the predict world. This is a, uh, this is, uh, these are the three main structures he evaluated in the uh, paper. Actually, the paper is uh, uh, is is to, uh, do, do not introduce more about the novelty of the model. It's focused more on the um, pre-training strategy or summer uh, effectiveness of uh, fine tuning. Uh, the paper is uh, uh, fifty uh, three page papers. Uh, three has. 53 pages, so you know, it's a long experiment uh, report. And he, uh, and the authors do extensive experiments uh, involves unsupervised objective. They test the different uh, super unsupervised objective. You know, in the pre-training, you need to fit the data into the, uh, the model we introduced before. And uh, the uh, super, uh, unsupervised objective is, uh, has many formulations and he tested them, them in the uh, different settings. Uh, another uh, structure, another direction is model structures. He tested three different structures in different uh, uh, settings. And uh, another one is uh, the pre training strategy. Uh, you know, the size and uh, the variance, uh, um, uh, they test the effectiveness of these parameters to the performance. And uh, next one is uh, training strategy. Uh, they use this uh, kind of uh, several uh, training strategy to do the pre uh, do the pre training. Uh, for example, you uh, train some uh, you train part of the data set, and uh, you test uh, uh, you test the uh, ratio of the tra pre training uh, data set to the final performance, and uh, it has the different uh, model parameters to the final performance and uh, the scaling of the data set or the uh, size of the model. They also try to assemble different models, for example, TrialNet and uh, uh, BERT to, uh, with T5. They try to assemble these different models to test the performance of, on the different tasks. This is a page of the, all, the, uh, all the experiments the author do in the original paper. As you can see, they do extensive uh, uh, experiments and uh, this all covers this uh, uh, aspect. So as a summary, uh, in conclusion, the first, uh, I think the first uh, direction is that uh, more and more people are trying to scale the data and the uh, model structures to uh, test their performance. And the second uh, direction is that uh, the pre-training is a popular trend in natural language processing and uh, uh, multitask learning is, uh, is necessary. You, if you want to uh, test the model's performance, you must prove that your model have a better performance on multitasks. And uh, the fourth one, the uh, first one is the multilingual learning. Uh, actually in machine translation, the uh, uh, T5 model didn't perform well in the, some benchmark uh, data sets. Uh, one reason is that uh, one reason is that the in machine translation uh, actually the researchers have many uh, tricks to do the uh, to do the evaluation. Uh, for example, the beam search or some other tricks to turn the uh, final uh, to improve the final performance. But in uh, C4 dataset, actually they don't have many multilingual dataset data. So in machine translation, they didn't perform well than the existing uh, baselines. Uh, the fifth uh, direction I think it maybe is uh, to incorporate more knowledge and the structured data. Uh, you know, now uh, BERT and uh, ChildNet or some other pre-training model just uh, learn, the, uh, learn the pattern from the uh, play text or uh, some unstructured text. Uh, Actually, there are extensive structured data in, uh, on the website web page. 
uh, for example, the uh, entity relation or some uh, relation uh, data. So how to incorporate the structured data into the pre-trained model is a, a problem. Actually, there have been there have several research efforts to do this uh, direction. For example, the early or summer uh, pre-training model with uh, structured data. The final direction I think maybe is efficiency. When you improve the size of the models, actually the efficiency is low. You have to use more computing power or data to train your model and fine tune the model into your task. So how to uh, efficiently uh, train the model and uh, improve the uh, train, uh, decrease the training time is an uh, uh, important problem. Uh, there are some efforts have been done to improve the efficiency. For example, the ARNet. ARNet actually use uh, regular regularization to uh, decrease the model parameters. You know, in um, BERT, there are several, uh, there are uh, uh, tens layers in the of the transformer, but uh, how to decrease the model parameters? Uh, it use uh, regularize to regularize the regularizer to regularize the uh, parameters of different layers into uh, same distribution. So actually it's decrease the uh, difference between the different layers, but uh, it's act actively, act actually born well in several tasks. So this is all about uh, my presentation today. Thank you. A lot of you are actually doing projects like those models, right? Yeah. So, uh, can we go around the room and, and whoever is doing something on language models, can you briefly describe what you're doing in the language model domain and whether you were successful or um, how your own standards um, in your project? Let's start from the table over here. So, any of you doing language model projects? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, Actually, uh, all of us uh, uh, are working on the uh, financial uh, news. Uh, financial news, uh, we are trying to um, um, try to uh, come up with an um, supervised learning model um, by my text generating uh, text uh, generation and hoping that uh, the, like, um, like, uh, uh, like some, uh, uh, which is uh, highlighted in the, like, uh, the uh, capital level, capital level, right. capital level, yeah, generation, uh, generation model, uh, and um, the, the model uh, actually do the same thing uh, for the uh, rate, for, yeah, to finance, uh, to finance, yeah, to review. So we are trying to duplicate a similar uh, process. And um, personally, for me, I'm trying to, um, I'm, I was trying the um, yeah, and, and the we, and both of them were. Um, not really successful. So yeah, other teammates uh, are also yeah, are trying the, the other model like the GP2, GPT2. So well, yeah, uh, I guess uh, yeah, they can be that. So so I'm in the same group as so can you guys out here, um, Kevin. So so I'm using GPT2 to do the financial news sentiment analysis. So uh, we haven't gone to the stage of sentiment analysis, so we use that for, for the text generation. I, think I shared it two or three weeks before, and it looks pretty amazing. Uh, what it amazed me is, was last week when we had the, the, the symposium, well, that, the, the professor at says that GPT students, what's the, what's the, what's the word? It's a high. It's just doing the end brand matching. Mm -hmm. uh, that that enlightens me a lot. And uh, yeah, and the thing that uh, the second presented this shit, uh, I, I resonate with it pretty much very well uh, because in, in our daily job, we are doing the sentiment analysis job for, for financial news. And usually, what we see is for small changes of the sentence will lead to huge 
uh, sentiment difference, even they are talking about the same thing. So, for example, it's like uh, Jerome Power says that the Fed going to increase interest rate by 25 basis points. If I just chop one word up from the sentence, it will turn from a positive to negative. Every day, for me, I was receiving the queries from the users um, on a daily basis. Why the sentiment is like this? Why the two sentences look very similar? And the result is so different. And uh, yeah, it's pretty difficult to answer. So I would, just now, I was hoping to like, be presenting a solution. <laughs> So, still a few years away. Do you have a couple? Oh, yeah, no, I, because uh, I'm working on a question answering my board as well. And we know that you know, like, just changing a couple of words or even like getting a few stops up would completely change. Some of the communication would be could give, like, one answer, one part message that would be completely out of my space or what would be looking to stop up, but completely out of my space. Right. So, so I guess because uh, I am working in a commercial company, in a fully commercial product, I'm getting the headache to answer all these queries every single day. So it's always like, yeah, you know, every day I'm trying to push in some of these <laughs> Why this looks different. So, yeah, pretty tough. We can get back to that. Okay, uh, anyone else in this table? I'm not working on my NLP. Okay, so let's uh, go around. Anyone else on this side of the room uh, working with uh, language models? So, Chang, you've actually done, done quite a lot of work on this. So, outside of the experiments that you highlighted in your archive paper, do you have any other things? To share. So, it's just not even about how to handle such situations. Um, I, I didn't mention in my presentation here, but uh, actually, most of the papers I've talked about, they mention this method of adulterous training. Basically, they add these adulterous uh, examples in the training set and then they try again. And sometimes it gets a, a bit of performance increase under those adulterous uh, tests. But I don't think that that's a very good solution. <laughs> yeah, because I like I see some people also try this. When they do a virtual training using this particular attack, then they uh, use this uh adversary trained model on some other attacks fails again. Yeah, so it's like specific to some attacks only. Yeah. So this is why the paper that you highlighted from the NLP just a few days ago is the universal attack. Yeah, so they're trying to think five things that are like the corollary in, in adversarial attacks and vision, right? You have a little bit of noise that's specifically designed to get the classified to go off the wrong classification. Okay, uh, anyone else from this side of the table? So, uh, when Jenny made the uh, talk just now, do you, are you also working on an uh, NLP? Well, I have a few something to start out to the text classification task. Actually, I have a special on my own after. I 
fluid uh, is better involved in short and uh, short statements. It's better involved in short statements. It has limited information in the original statements. When you incorporate more uh, data in the training process, it's actually more well in class to the right table. Okay, so uh, I guess you're saying that for short inputs, uh, yeah. these language models are sufficient even though they can be cool. They're not really learning uh, information, but they have enough statistical correlation with what we want them to do um, on a normal basis and not on an adversarial basis. That they can perform well. okay. well, yesterday, there's an article that said they find that they need statistical models. Yeah, I think Eugene also shared it on our Slack chat. So they, they during the very good article I just posted, they actually posted a four year plumbing in the system. So it is quite uh, I mean because when you just said it does an engram class, right? I just that posted my slide. No, yeah. And it's a look at this. I mean it's poetry is quite the second part is for this. I'm not sure how many tries or what. Yeah, so let's let's pull it up. So I'll stop the share and then uh, we can go back to the other one. Share to my desktop. Can go to Slack. So you're saying the bottom part of this, okay, is generated by the new model. Okay. No, it's, yeah, it's not putting random words together. They're putting random words that came from other texts that, that have some semantic overlap, right, together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of us would have problems composing poems as well. So it's, it spells problems for our uh, primary and school, primary and secondary school uh, English teachers, right? I mean, if you take an MOE uh, essay prompt and put it in, maybe it'll generate a pretty good essay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and don't, don't ask your cousins, nieces, and nephews to use GPT-2, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, other comments? Who else is doing uh, language modeling or, or NLP work uh, for their projects? No one else? Uh, I'm currently trying to try something with machine translation. Okay. Shenteng, go on. Do you have any insights that you want to share with us about that? Uh, uh, so it's kind of uh, the way that the basic approach that I have seen so far is that you do one help hot encoding of the words and uh, they try to match it using attention and that's how you map from one language to the other so it's like essentially your model is kind of learning a generative mapping from one language to the other so there's a paper that i'm uh, kind of going through but i haven't quite finished that is actually 
instead of using attention, they're trying to use again to do machine uh, translation. So hopefully, the paper. Getting... sorry, you have the title of the paper. Uh, hang on, just give me a moment. Yeah, you can put it in Slack if it's easy. So the title of the paper is Adversarial Neural Machine Translation. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, I know some of these folks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm hoping to at least to see if I can actually replicate their approach and maybe hopefully I can try on a different language pair than the one that they have, uh, the pairs that they have looked at in the paper because they only look at uh, English to French and they also look at uh, German to English, yeah. Okay, so are you able to get it to converge? Are you looking at this problem right now or um, this is some future work that you're looking at? Uh, I'm, well, I mean, I, 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 I was working, well, I was working on a project earlier, but uh, I kind of spent quite a long time trying to reconfigure my server. So I haven't really started running any code. So. I'll know if it converges in the next couple of days. Okay. All right, so um, yeah. We can take a look at this paper more uh, for those of you who are interested more on GAN approaches. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks Shenting. So anyone else want to discuss language models, their approaches so far? Otherwise, I think we'll end for the day. Uh, so again, a reminder, STEPS is next Wednesday. Um, if you want to print your posters, uh, again, technical services in COM1 is open during normal business hours to print the posters. It's free of charge. For those of you who are off campus and can't print, uh, I think you can uh, just message on the general channel, upload your uh, PPT or PDF, hopefully at high resolution. And uh, hopefully somebody within the class who is local to NUS, like we have a whole bunch of undergraduates here who are doing uh, DYC uh, uh, 4101. Um, they, some of them may be able to help you print it. So if, if any of you are free, uh, you can uh, volunteer to print some of the posters, okay? If not, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll find somebody else who, who can do it, okay? So as I said earlier, but I think some of you weren't here at the beginning of class, um, next week during STEPS, I have to be busy um, circulating for my other class. Uh, so we're grading all of the projects for uh, 20 projects for um, our machine learning class, the undergraduate class. So I'll be busy, but I hope all of you will have a, a chance to visit each other's posters and interact. Um, and then some of the CS3244 people I think are gonna come your way because you know, you guys are sort of like a little bit more upstream of them uh, in terms of the applications you're doing. So you'll find that quite a lot of their projects are, are congruent uh, to your projects. So you may want to check uh, how what they're doing, okay? So uh, again, no class next week, it's just steps. And then the final class is during reading week, Thursday and reading week, okay? All right, so thanks very much for coming. So we'll see you on steps uh, again. You have your registration already, so you have uh, food coupons. Um, so you need to find me or uh, I'll probably put them on your poster board, um, you know, the tickets for your food. So uh, I
time is, uh, I think, 6 to 10, 6 to 10 p.m. You don't have to stay for the whole 10. I know many people like to bow out even though there's an awards ceremony at the end. So like I said earlier, the awards ceremony is usually they do popular voting for best projects. So I think our class, because we have about 20 projects, we're likely to get two prizes. So if you, um, if you win a prize, it's nice if you're around to collect it. It's sort of embarrassing for us if you're not around. Um, unfortunately, we won't know uh, until pretty close to the time it's ready uh, who the winners are. Okay, but uh, you know, there's a, a number attached to each poster. Uh, it's the same one that's in steps. So if you go to the steps website, anyone who's attending steps, including yourself, you, can, you obviously can vote for yourself. Um, and, and you should uh, try to get other people to vote for you. So uh, again, uh, you will have to key in some information, like if you wanted to vote for project two, you would key in um, uh, whatever the poster ID is on the form. There'll be a, a QR code that scans to a Google form, and then you can just write down three best projects. Okay, it doesn't have to be from our class, but of course, if you vote for our class, then um, you know it'll help reweight the, the popular vote for it. So um, lecturers are supposed to be able to give uh, more weight for their votes, and they actually get an in industrial professional, uh, somebody from the deep learning area will be reviewing our class. So uh, that person will have a bit more weight in terms of the weight voltage for that. Okay, yeah. So I hope uh, you get a chance to print your posters. There is no template this year. So in the past, there was a, a, a project template that you had to use because we had to put the names of the sponsors on the posters. But now um, I think they relaxed that requirement. So uh, we don't have a poster template. So you can put your own organization's template on there or, or do whatever you'd like. OK? All right. So um, this next week, again, there's no class. The following week after that um, is our last class. We don't have any more classes afterwards. So uh, let me just uh, find, a, find a spreadsheet. So that means the week 12 people uh, we'll be presenting because there's no there's no week 13 is there I think we took the week 13 out uh, we didn't take the work week 13 out so those of you in uh, week 12 and 13 you guys can jointly try to present um, the last week the uh, reinforcement learning for uh, uh, representations okay so there's uh, at least, I guess, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people, including Yitza. Um, so the, the, all of you will be um, taking on uh, the role of presenting for the last week. So uh, please use the, the, the channel um, to do that. So I think uh, on here, we, we can just take everyone from week 12, uh, week 13 and move them to week 12. So I'll just write here. Please. Oops. Okay, any other questions? No, okay, then thanks very much for coming. So we'll, we'll see you at Steps next week.